gentlemen, I give you Ed Wiener, the historian of our Friars Club. Thank you, Joe. Gentlemen, it is not very often that an organization such as the Friars Club is obliged to get together like this to do a benefit for an actor. But seriously, New York has always given Humphrey Bogart a royal welcome. Here's a telegram from John Perona of El Morocco to our guest of honor. Stay out of my fucking joint. Here's a telegram from Clark Gable. Congratulations on your comeback. We thought you were too old to come again. And one from Frank Sinatra. Great success with your next picture, Zanuck of the North. <laughs> Here's one from Bob Hope. Fuck you and the seven little boys. Here's another telegram I'd like to read. Uh, congratulations and continued suck, Liberace. <laughs> Our guest of honor made his debut in a Broadway play, Swifty, in 1921, and happily was able to outlive the merciless criticism of the late Alexander Walcott, an old fag, and went on... and went on to achieve the highest honors in show business. 30 years later, he won an Academy Award Oscar for his performance in The African Queen. Previously, he had won two nominations for the award in 43 for Casablanca and in 47 for The Treasure of Sierra Madre. He is nominated again for an Oscar for his great performance in, as Captain Quig in the Cane Mutiny. He served in the Navy during World War I fucked up the books in Wall Street after his discharge from the Navy, <laughs> and then to, went to work as an assistant stage manager, casting director, and production manager for the late William A. Brady. After learning the backstage trade, he turned to acting. Broadway successes in which he took part include Cradle Snatchers, Saturday's Children, It's a Wise Child, and then came The Petrified Forest which launched him on the road to success as a Hollywood film star. His newest picture, The Left Hand of God, marks his 48th screen role. It's one of his best. His most recent films include The Cane Mutiny, Sabrina, The Desperate Hours, and My Three Angels. We are very proud of the fact that Humphrey Bogart, our guest of honor, is a native New Yorker. He was born on December 25, and so the Friars are very honored to run this pre-Christmas birthday party in his honor. Before the editorial staff of Confidential Magazine is heard from, <laughs> we would suggest that Humphrey keep in mind something the late Damon Runyon once wrote. When we rib a friend, we always do it with the deepest of our affection and with the deepest sincerity, welcome. And now, gentlemen, it is my pleasure to turn the proceedings over to a young old man who will be your master of ceremonies. He was the comedy find of 1954 who got lost in 55. <laughs> uh, he is at the top of the hit parade of all television writers. He buried more than 62 of them, including Shakespeare, during the past year. It is a pleasure to present the secretary of the Friars Club, Red Buttons. Pretty funny speech. Who wrote it? 
Good afternoon, gentlemen. Members of the dais, Dean, Pryor, Abbott, the honored guest, Mr. Bogart. I am uh, very, very honored to have been chosen to be the Toastmaster here this afternoon for so distinguished an actor and personality as Mr. Humphrey Bogart. It's been my idol ever since I was a kid, and uh, <laughs> I just, I, I really feel wonderful. I, You'll have to pardon me, I'm still a little choked up about Eddie Weiner's speech. <laughs> I, I've seen you in all your pictures, Mr. Bogart. I want you to know that I'm one of your big fans. I, one picture in particular, I remember I, I loved you, Nat. Do you remember that was a picture in the South Pacific where you hit the beachhead and, and you got off that LST and you got on the beach and you were kind of climbing, you remember? And you went under the barbed wires, you had the revolver in a hand going all the time, you remember? And then the Japanese in the tank, they pinned down a division, you ran on, opened the turret, you opened the thing, boom! All the Japanese blew up, you remember that? You're full of shit, it was John Wayne. Give you an idea what a lion cocksucker we got here this afternoon with us. Picture was Iwo Jima. He even killed a few Germans on that beachhead. Fucking guests. You are here today, Mr. Bogart, because the card room has a deficit of $1,100. And don't forget it. These guys come in from the coast, you know what I mean, Jenny, and, you know. Our first speaker this afternoon, unfortunately, couldn't be here. But it's somebody I think that Mr. Bogart knows very well. And uh, although the speaker is not here, the recording speaks for itself. Couldn't give you a more direct cue than that. <laughs> Pointed a finger, said it in English. <laughs> Fuck it, I won. And my first affair, too. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that. This is Lauren Bacall. Yeah, Mrs. Bogart, the uninvited guest. You rat bastards. <laughs> When Rosie told me that the Fives were giving a luncheon in his honor, I was delighted. But when he told me that I couldn't attend because it was a stag, I sure was disappointed. I said, Bogey, why can't I go? He said, Baby, it's gonna be a little rough. You know how men act at a stag. So that's why women aren't allowed. See? Well, I was furious. In fact, I was goddamn mad. What the hell can the fire say that you haven't called me? <laughs> I must tell you of an incident that happened to Bogey before I met him. He was keeping company with a girl, and one day while he was waiting in front of her house, she wanted Bogey to go to the store for her. So she opened the window and called out, Hop free! Hop free! And 20 guys ran up to her room. <laughs> Boys, don't think this guy, Bogey, is easy to live with. When Bogey gets his script for a picture, especially where he plays a tough guy, he studies his part with so much sincerity, you'd think our home was a hideout, and he was really on the lam. When he has his script memorized, he puts so much realism into it, he really believes that he's a tough guy. Why, Bogey even fights in his sleep. He wakes me up three or four times a night and says... Baby, hold my gun. <laughs> hey, hey. 
<laughs> That's it. That was Lauren Bacall. <laughs> You can buy the album at the Colony Record Shop. <laughs> You're fucking a nice girl like that. He says, just lucky, I guess. <laughs> the first speaker in person this afternoon is a young man currently appearing at Lou Waller's Latin Quarter. He's making an awful lot of noise. And uh, they say that he's one of the fastest comers in show business. If you don't believe me, ask his wife. about this boy that Lee Mortimer has said, next to Key Luke, he's the funniest youngster in the business. <laughs> Let's welcome to the speaker stand a very clever young guy, Alan King. Thank you very much, Pinky. And uh, I'm Red, and uh, I am very happy to be here this afternoon. As you see, I, I'm prepared. I wrote everything down. And uh, being the youngest gentleman on the dais, they asked me to speak first. Besides that, they figured I'm not going to be very tough to follow. They're playing it pretty cool, these bastards. <laughs> and uh, this is my first time on the dais. I'm very happy about the idea of not having to pay for a ticket. I don't know anything about Mr. Bogart. If they'd have given this luncheon a Stengel, I would have had an hour and a half of beautiful fucking things to say <laughs> to that miserable prick. <laughs> and as you see by the language I've used in my opening lines, that I have been at many of these functions, and I found out in order to be able to speak on a dais of this type, you must have a cigar, you must, of course, use profane language, and you must suck. <laughs> I have a testimonial here for my wife. She wasn't able to make a recording, but... Uh, <laughs> in uh, doing research on Mr. Bogart, I gave it a lot of thought. It took me an hour and a half to drive in from the island. Besides cursing a few drivers, I gave this entire afternoon a lot of thought. And I realized that I hadn't seen very many of Mr. Bogart's pictures which they tell me is just as well. But um, his first picture that I can remember was a thing called Dead End, which I always thought was the story of Sally Violinsky. I didn't, you know. And then he made a picture called The Petrified Forest, which I figured was the story of a broad in a hotel on 49th Street waiting for Lou Holtz to get a heart on. And... And she's still there. <laughs> and of course the desperate hours is waiting for Holtz to appear you know and of course the one that they mentioned I didn't even know that he won the Academy Award for African Queen I thought it was the life story of Johnny and George who are two fair counter players you bastards I worked on that line all morning and it lay there I really have enjoyed Mr. Bogart many times he's and according to his roles, he's appeared as a prick in most of his pictures. And I saw the desperate hours on the coast, and he's a prick in this one. And um, I think it was a fair exchange. We sent Burl to the coast, who was the biggest prick we had. And they sent us Humphrey Bogart. Thank you. Alan Wonderful. Alan King. And this is the last time you're going to hear about this boy. <laughs> Next gentleman on my left is one I met some years ago in California, just for a brief handshake. I've been an admirer for a good many years. 
He was in the business acting and acting pretty good, I'm sure, before I was born. Great actor, a wonderful gentleman. Give you an idea what kind of a gentleman he is. He always removes his monocle before he takes a piss. Mr. Charles Coburn. <laughs> that is not the reason I removed my monocle. I'm ashamed to look down. substitute for the dirty words, I'll just say da-da, da-da, da-da. And this is the story. Da-da, da-da, da-da. Da-da, da-da. Da-da, da-da, da-da. Fuck. The dirtiest mind in the world is the mind of a censor. They never see anything in anything except filth. And I'll tell you a brief story which epitomizes the censorship mind. Many years ago, there was a little minstrel company called High Henry's Minstrel. It came to a town called Westchester, Pennsylvania. And a man called at the hotel and asked to see the manager and presented himself as a self-appointed guardian of public morals. He said to the manager, I understand you boys have got some dirty jokes. And I said, well, that's very strange. We pride ourselves on having a very clean show. Well, he said, I want to tell you I'm going to be in the first row tonight with my wife. And the first one that pulls a dirty joke, I'll stop the show. He said, that's all right, mister. So he was there in the first row and everything was going along fine. Finally, the star end man comes on with a fanfare and rattle of bones and tambourine. And says, good evening, Mr. Inlogan. He says, good evening, Mr. Bones. Mr. Inlogan, tell me, what is the best thing about a woman? Well, really, Mr. Bones, I don't know. Tell me, what is the best thing about a woman? And this guy jumps up and says, if he says, cunt, I'll stop the show. <laughs> I went to see Humphrey Bogart play when I was a boy. <laughs> I used to play later on, when he was an old man, I was playing pool with him down at the Players Club. He was always a son of a bitch. <laughs> mean bastard. And that's why they cast him in these parts. I've never seen him on the screen. Thank God. <laughs> But I'm looking forward to seeing the next picture that he does. Uh, I caught a little bit of it last night. Boy, does it stink. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful thing, really. Humphrey, uh, I congratulate you. Charlie Carver, isn't he wonderful? Let's give a nice big hand on the way out. He's got to leave. He's got a cocksucker waiting for him. <laughs> you are pretty mean, you know that. That's right tell you how mean he is. Even the good guy in the picture's a prick. <laughs> Why did I say that? Just when you're rolling. <laughs> I'd like you to meet one of the all-time great champions. 
I grew up with him. I was a kid on the Lower East Side, and I must have mentioned his name maybe three, four times a day. Every time a kid had hit... Same grin he had on his face when he hit Jack Sharkey in the balls. <laughs> and I didn't even have that on the cards. I made that up. <laughs> French delegation walked out, but they left us one of the best goodwill ambassadors that France has ever had. Gentlemen, Maurice Chevalier. I didn't expect to, 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 to have to talk, and uh, really, I, I'm not prepared, but I, I feel that I have to thank you anyhow, you see. I've come back in your uh, wonderful country only one week ago, and I've got to adjust myself to the new kind of America that I'm seeing, you see. For a Frenchman, it's very hard to talk about so many cocksuckers and... Uh, <laughs> trying to adjust myself to that new America and a lot of things seem to have changed a lot, you see, because uh, when today I, I saw something that really, <laughs> because it came from a fellow <laughs> in all Broadway. So I wish you all the best and I'll try to do my very best to deserve to be received in such a great country, so friendly. Thank you very much. The one and only, the great Maurice Chevalier. Let's have a nice picture. Wonderful to have you back. And in the words of your countrymen, a revedetchi. meet a young man he's been around Broadway a long long time this is really a uh, display of affection for the guest of honor that he showed up he kind of likes to stay up late and sit around with the boys he doesn't look too good he's just kind of sits around referring to a young man who whose act killed more Jews <laughs> And Myron Cohn. As a matter of fact, he this morning he had a jerk off twice just to get his heart started. <laughs> Star of Wall Street. Young man who just came in from the West Coast with some of that well-known fuck you money. <laughs> Lou Holtz. Well, I certainly want to thank you. I, uh, I haven't got anything on the paper. I live out, oh, your paper. I live out in California. 
I've only been here a few weeks, and I want to tell you that out here, out there, all shit heels. <laughs> Everybody out there is a shit heel. I don't know why. I guess it's the sun. <laughs> if you got, if you're a nice fella and you got about four percent shit heel in you, the sun seems to drag it out. <laughs> but I can honestly say. Although there are a lot of shit heels out there, this does not go for Humphrey Bogart. Because anybody that could be sweethearts with George Rapp for eight years has got to be a nice fella. <laughs> he and Raft are very close. And about Mr. Chevalier, since he don't know anything about all this, this talk with the cocksucker. And the contrapeur. <laughs> He's been playing with my brick for half an hour. Talking to Raft about Mr. Bogart, he thinks he's a hell of an actor. Of course, you saw him in the Kane Mutiny. You know where he plays with the ball. But Raft says that he can play with a pair of balls in a room. Well, of course, everything you make up, it can't be good. See, but in California, in California, you know, this is on the square about the shit heels. <laughs> Just amazing. I've been living out there a long while, and I was on the dais one night with Burns and Benny and Danny Kay. They always have the same cast. And Sam Goldwyn was on the dais. Now, I've known Sam Goldwyn all my life. I've been living out there for years, and he walked over to me, and he says, Lou, he says, how are you? He talks like a Jew, you know. <laughs> Louis says, certainly glad to see you. He says, how long have you been in town? I said, about 11 years. <laughs> yeah, this is the truth. Now, in closing, <clears throat> <clears throat> as I told you before, I don't have any jokes. I've been laying off. Well, I've been smoking now for eight years. It's my only business. I smoke. Of course, they say all over the country that they say I suck a lot. <laughs> they have to talk. They got to say something. They got to tear you down, you know. I give you my sacred word of honor, gentlemen that I have never sucked a cunt in an airplane in my life. <laughs> I can honestly say that I have been a member of the Face Men of America for over, over 30 years. And they, well, they always said I was the best. <laughs> and I don't think it's fair for them on an afternoon like this. I don't think it's fair. I don't think it's fair to me for them to go and import the greatest, the greatest face man from France <laughs> to sit here on the dais with me. But gentlemen, if this is a challenge, <laughs> he has the best of me. I'm 62, he's 69.
And you know what 69 is, you lying bastards. And but for money, marbles, or chalk, I will take him into... I'll take him into any hotel, into any given suite, with six or seven girls, stretch them out, and I will outsuck him six to one. Thank you. Last speech came to us through the courtesy of the Gaiety Delicatessen. <laughs> Another great champion, a wonderful, wonderful guy, loved by all, I'm sure, Bonnie Ross. sucked you to beat Armstrong. You know that, don't you? But you blew it. I never knew that about you, Lou. I never knew that about you. A few more introductions of a few guests out front. The Honorable Tom Curran, Chairman of the State of New York Republican Party. Where's Mr. Curran? Another year to grab it in. <laughs> the uh, former commissioner of commerce. Why don't they bring the real commissioner? Why don't they fuck me up with these things? Uh? <laughs> Very nice guy and a good friend of mine, Walter Shirley. Wallach, set up the fellas I was in the army with, they're here together today, uh, wonderful boys, are doing a great act, the shorter of the two, is a big hero, they, they never use it though in their publicity, uh, during the war he received one of the highest awards ever given to any non-com in the history of the military of the United States service, he was the only one who had enough guts to order a retreat while still at Fort Dix, <laughs> let's have the Blackburn twins stand up and take a bow. The Blackburns, the Perez Boys. Members of the Fourth Estate, very, very happy to have you here today, all my friends. Louis Sobel of the Journal, Earl Wilson of the Post, Leonard Lyons of the Post, the Boxing Commissioner is with us today, Julius Helfand. Mr. Helfand, nice to see you. What are you sitting here for? Why aren't you out catching crooks? These guys are fuck up on the job. There's a young man that's got to get out. He's doing seven shows tonight. The owner of his own bar mitzvah. Alan Gale. Shh, please. In a few years, you'll be up here, son. Great band leader just returned from a cruise. Uh, Return from a cruise. I'm sorry. Maya Davis. All right, we go. Who's next? Now you laugh, you schmuck. You. <laughs> Just did the big joke. You sat there like you were dead. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, as long as he's hot, we might as well bring him up. Here's an old Hungarian appearing at the old Romanian. <laughs> the, the illegitimate son of Sadie Banks. One of the biggest sports we have in the business. This kid is really a sporty kid and a big spender. Give you an idea of what a big sport this boy is. 
Two winters ago, he ran out of a burning hotel in Miami, completely naked. He had his hat on and his pants over his arm. He ran out, he got a hold of a fireman. He said, pardon me. He said, did you see a beautiful red-headed broad with two big tits with a nice ass? Fireman said, no. He said, well, if you see her, give her a fuck for me. It's all paid for already. <laughs> big spot. He's going to die, so we might as well get it over with. Gene Bellis. Gee, this is wonderful. I'll tell you the truth. I don't know Humphrey Bogart, so fuck him. <laughs> you remember Red Buttons, who used to be very popular many years ago? And uh, I came here this afternoon first to... Uh, not to eat. <laughs> I didn't like this. I'm doing a double. I'm working with another prick now. Johnny Johnson I got enough trouble with. But I'll tell you, I didn't come here to make with the jokes. The real truth is the car's going to Jersey and the game starts in the afternoon. I opened tonight at the Old Romanian. I'm working for this cocksucker. And now, don't look now, but I think I'm auditioning. <laughs> Every fucking job I get, I'm auditioning. And I was at the Riviera uh, with Tony Martin. They tore down the building. I worked a couple of spots in California. They closed that. Now I'm looking to make an A&P out of this joint. <laughs> all the other guys come up, all the comics, all the comedians. But... Uh, Humphrey, I work the, uh, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I make with the jokes and all that, but I very seldom have a chance. And uh, incidentally, uh, Joey Lewis is the president of AGVA. He doesn't know what the fuck he's just signed, but he thinks it's the uh, Actors Venereal Girls Association. He doesn't know what the hell he's doing. He's loaded. And uh, I don't know how the hell he got up. He didn't get up. He didn't go to sleep yet. But... Uh, I never had the chance of saying something nice about Mr. Bogart. I've seen him in his latest picture, Public Enemy Number One, and uh, four-star matzo ball. I want to tell you that. And uh, with Laura McCall, the record, that's all bullshit. That's Sadie Banks. <laughs> See, no jokes, not prepared, just witty little fucking things I do. Little fucking little witty little things. They always call me up on these things to save the show. <laughs> we introduce the, uh, the press, we introduce from the Post, the, the Journal, the Mirror, the News, we forgot the graphic, <laughs> and the forwards. <laughs> I'd like to thank the press for the very nice uh, now notices I'll be getting for this show. Uh, and... Uh, I'll tell you the truth, I can have you screaming up here, but I'd rather have you come down to the old Romania because I got a good deal there with Silverman. I get a, I don't get a salary, I get 10% over $180,000. But I'm the only entertainer in the show that's allowed to cook in the dressing room. I made a flunkin' fucking dinner last night. <laughs> Uh, I just played a famous hotel in Miami Beach, the Fountain Blue. Fabulous hotel. It's a little overdone. They got an eight-piece band playing in the men's room. <laughs> I think all they need is piano and violin is enough. <laughs> There's no room for dancing. <laughs> witty, huh? <laughs> Hope to shit I'm witty. <laughs> and uh, you're coughing right in my kisser. I'm not going to do the old joke and say, why don't you use what I use when I have an old cough? I don't want to blow these fucking jokes. All the comics are looking to grab now. But, uh... Did I get the feeling in the wrong business? I don't want to take up too much of your time. You've been a wonderful audience. I hope to come back for the next Friar luncheon. Well, I got to get used now. Get charged for the dinner. I flopped the whole fucking thing yet. I'll tell you the fucking truth, it's Marty eating chicken for breakfast. <laughs> but as far as Mr. Bogart, I think you're a great actor. I'd like to have you down for my opening. 
because this is what Silverman's been bullshitting me all week. Just come to the friars, bring down some fucking actors, because I didn't read the clause. <laughs> and I got to work exceptionally fast now because I got to get over to the Paramount and see if there's any mail. <laughs> and, uh, fucking idiots, look at these people. There's no, there's no shows no more, don't you get it? <laughs> oh, fucking idiots these are. They look at me like losers. But I'd like to thank you all. I'd like to wish you all a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Because I don't think I'll be around this way again. <laughs> but you've been very, very kind, Mr. Bogart. You're a great actor, and I'd like to be a great comedian like you are a great actor. This cocksucker is murder. I don't know what the fuck to do. Sally Violinsky. Sally! <clears throat> There's very little difference between me and Hope the uh, Bogart. She is a menace in pictures, and I was a menace in vaudeville. I used to be in Baltimore. I did about uh, four or five minutes. I was next to closing on a three-act bill, but most of the time I was next to being closed on any bill. <laughs> I played London in 1910. There's one thing I'll say about an English audience. They're very loyal, and they never forget an act. That's why I never went back. <laughs> I got tired of acting, so I started to write songs. I remember the first song I ever wrote was a moonlight song that never saw daylight. <laughs> I once received a check from ASCAP, and on the back of the check was written foreign royalties from England, France, and Australia. That same day, I went into a pool room that were the bed horses, and I lost the three countries. <laughs> I don't, I don't think Nick the Geek ever lost a state or a city. So I got tired of that. I went to Hollywood to go in pictures. That is a great town. I was there for two years before I found out that I was stranded. <laughs> but my day come, I got a call, phone call from a studio wanted me to do a gangster in a picture. So I got to the studio, and I saw, saw two rival gangs. I asked the director which gang he wanted me in. He says, pick anyone you want. And to show you how lucky I am, the gang that I picked was knocked off the first day. <laughs> Out in Hollywood, the only thing you could see at nighttime was a soft ball game played by beautiful dames. So I step into a ballpark one night and I ran into Harry Cohn of the Columbia Pictures. I says to Harry, why don't you sponsor one of these teams? I said, you're a fan and uh, you put a Columbia uniform on the dames and you'll have something to lose for. He said, it's a great idea. How do I get one? I said, I know the manager of this team. So I went and saw the manager and the next morning, I phoned Harry Cohen. I said, Harry, you are now the owner of the softball team. He said, hey, Violinsky. I said, wait a minute. I want to ask you, you to do me a favor. Now his voice lawyer, he thinks that I'm going to ask him for a favor or a job. He says, uh, what is it, Sally? I said, I'd like to fuck your shortstop. <laughs> still doing. <laughs> I went into show 
opens in the hard way. I play the piano in the whorehouse. I play the piano so good that the customer used to stop in the middle of the fucking to applaud me. <laughs> That's what gave me the idea of going to show business. I knew that, they, that they, they'd have to applaud in the theater. So what do you think happened? They were still fucking. <laughs> I had a burning desire just to have everybody stand up and cheer me when I did my act. So I got up a finish for the finale of my act. I had a dame walking to the piano stark naked. And I played the Star Spangled Banner very quietly. And there wasn't a prick in the audience that didn't stand up. <laughs> Thank you, Sally. Sally Violetsky. Thank you. Like you to meet a wonderful guy. Great wit. He probably hates me by now for saving him for last. But uh, it was to this boy that Milton Berle once said, Hey kid, you want to see my cock? <laughs> and that's the way it all started. I love him. I was at his home last night celebrating his birthday. The very, very wonderful Jan Murray. Jan, come on. You and I never met, but uh, we both got a good fucking here tonight. You, uh, this afternoon, you as the guest of honor, they straighten you out pretty good, sir. I'm a man who, who respects you. These other guys here, you know, I thought, I was, I thought I'd vomit here today. <laughs> I, I feel so out of place on this whole day. I'm the only one still fucking, you know what I mean? And I felt like I was in the wrong building or something, you know. I felt like I was a fag, you know, doing something unnatural. <laughs> Don't breathe on me, you will. <laughs> anyway, uh... <laughs> Why the hell I was saved for last? I'm not a friar, and I, I think it would have been nice manners on their part if they didn't put me on kind of early, you know, so I feel like I'm a little humpy, too. Because you know what a hit I'll be now? <laughs> I had a lot of, uh, I, I, you know, I was really handicapped. I've only been at three luncheons uh, or, or affairs of the Friars. I, I was here once honoring uh, Milton Berle, you know, where, where I told about seeing his cock. That was a momentous occasion. And then, <laughs> and then they had a thing for Dean and Jerry at the, at the Waldorf last year, and I appeared there. And then uh, they had one thing for Red, a luncheon last year, and I appeared to that. I don't know if they were celebrating his cancellation or something. They got some fucking macabre sense of humor in this club, you know. It's a man just got canceled. They threw him a big wing ding here, you know what I mean? With such tears and crying. Anyway, look at this, he's coughing. Is that you or Holtz? You know, I'm, I keep worrying he doesn't get any on my suit. I'm going home later. Anyway, <laughs> one piece meat. And uh, so uh, at least I, I felt equipped to get up at those luncheons and talk because we have background that is similar, Red and, and Milton and Jerry and Dean and, you know, myself, we kicked around together and everything, and I know I could tell you stories about our past life. We had so much in common, but a great motion picture star like Mr. Bogart, they asked me to come down here. No one said, we'll put you on, you know, after Nila, you know what I mean? They, they just said, come in, you'll eat a little bit, and you'll get up and say a few words. I said, I don't know, Mr. Bogart, how could I dare get up, you know, say funny things about him? But I thought of a lot of funny things to say, and I heard them all afternoon, you know? <laughs> I had a routine about him slugging it out with this fucking dame for the panda that would have rocked the place forever, you know? So Phil, like, made shit out of it, but he said panda, so I blew that thing, you know? All he said was panda, nothing. I had seven minutes on this fucking thing. I was fighting a girl at El Morocco for a panda, you know, what heroism, what fearlessness, you know, this, this gives itself to a big routine. Because the only broad he ever backed down to, and I know this, he didn't know me, but I was at Leon and Eddie's and I witnessed it. You know, forget the El Morocco incident. The only broad he ever backed down to was Lois the Faye when she tried to grab his alligator one day at Leon and Eddie's. You know what toys this man plays with, pandas and alligators? But, uh, so I had a bunch of that shit prepared because I don't know the man. I mean, Kutcher's Country Club, you never worked, right? We have no background, right? There's no common background. We have them Paul's Hotel in Swan Lake. 
Huh? Flagler. I'll mention all of you. Never were in any of those places, right? That's all. So what the hell am I going to discuss with this boy? <laughs> you know what Kutch's is like, don't you? You know, in Hollywood, they got the brown derby crowd. In Kutch's, they have the black yarmulke mob. <laughs> it's a whole different set of people up there. And so, you know, there's no reminiscing with Mr. Bogart except uh, what I read about him in the papers. Uh, you know, knowing about the beautiful wife he uh, married and that, I thought that was a terrific thing, the recording. When I listened to it, I, you know, it shows she's a real good sport. And uh, it was beautiful. I got a big kick out of that. And, of course, that's one of the advantages of being... Uh, well, one of the things that shows Mr. Bogart is brave, not only on screen, but off screen, you know. He must be, well, let's be friendly. A 55er, would you say? 53er? I, I don't know. I'm not even going to add. A 5er? 55er. Well, this takes plenty of guts to marry a girl like 23, right? <laughs> right? You know what heroism you need for this? I'm married to a girl only six years younger. <laughs> you know the oysters I've consumed in two years? Here's a man married a girl 23! Ooh, what a girl. Thank you, Earl. And, uh... Get away, I'm floundering here, and I can't even think of one story. <laughs> Uh, so what do you want to do now? <laughs> I'm trying to think of what wasn't said here. Fucking bit is they won't even invite me back ever again on the day. Who oh, a fucking floppy was? We saved him for last yet. Look at this thrill. <laughs> Anyone thinks I got a closing number? You're crazy. No songs, nothing. Anyway, Mr. Bogart. What? You see nothing. What anyway, Mr. Bogart? <laughs> what do you say to him? I don't... <laughs> get a guy on the day that doesn't know the man they're honoring. Well, anyhow, Humphrey, what anyhow? What? What did we ever do? What? What anyhow? Where? What? You know, you ever see this for fucking embarrassment? This they say for last, like a man's going to get up, reminisce with him. He's also looking at me strange. It was this putz that's coming up here talking now. You know? <laughs> anyway, Mr. Bogart, he never saw me in his life. <laughs> oh, I never worked with my uncle and father. Who the hell do you think I am? <laughs> Look how mixed up he is. I thought I worked with my uncle and father. But one thing I know, you never worked the mountains. What kind of name is Humphrey for a Jewish boy? <laughs> Anyhow. Well, I'll tell you, maybe I'll tell you one story. Thank God I thought of something just now. Maybe you didn't, maybe you didn't hear it. Probably everybody in the joints heard it, but I'm a square. I live out in the country now, and I don't get around to hear these gags much. <laughs> you know what was killing me? Driving down today, I was uh, I was thinking of a gag that had the word shit in it, and I was debating with myself all the way down. Shall I tell it? No, you better not. Shit, you know you don't know, Mister Bogart. You're going to get up shit. Like the opening line. Hello, you old cocksucker. How do you feel, you fuck? You know I never heard such a thing in my life. This was the opening. Where the hell do you go from here? You know. Man, Chevalier is a beautiful man. A fucking long, he's been coming here a hundred years. The accent gets thicker every year. I couldn't understand him at all. I don't, I don't know what the hell he was saying. Uh... <laughs> That's the only way I know See if these schmucks imitate him all these years. You know how I many mimics made a living from him? It's easy to be the easiest man in Hollywood to imitate. Little plastic surgery. You remove the upper lip and that's it. You do the whole imitation. Anyway, this, this story I wanted to tell you, it's, uh, I hope you haven't heard it, honestly. It, it concerns uh, uh, Humphrey. I feel friendly already. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> he's the one thing you got to say. It's a great, you know, this is the busiest actor in the whole show business industry. Two pictures, two big pictures opening this week. One open already, right? Left Hand of God and uh, Desperate Hours. This morning I was shaving and got him on my electric shaver. You can't miss this man anymore, you know? All over the lot this boy is, and it's wonderful because he's a great actor. In Left Hand of God, he plays a priest. Is this typecasting? <laughs> a priest. Two days after the picture was released, 3,000 drunks became religious fanatics all over the country, you know? I told you I didn't know. I'm trying to think. I read once he drank, once he... Well, listen, I'll tell you the story. In uh, in Central Park, you know the tavern on the green, Humphrey. They, they, 
So they have a little club there. A lot, a lot of elderly gentlemen come there, 80, 90-year-old guys. You know, they come around and play chess, check. It's just a nice little place for them to sit around. So one day, like a new candidate came over, a wrinkled guy, you know, snow-white hair. He sat down. He said, gentlemen, you mind if I join you? And I said, no, sit down. So I talked to him for about a half hour, asking him where he's from, et cetera, his name, and so forth. And so finally, one of the guys said, boy, he begins to notice the guy doesn't wear a hearing aid, hasn't got false teeth, doesn't wear eyeglasses. He says, boy, he says, you're in pretty good condition. He says, you, you look pretty good. He says, yeah, thank God, I hear, I see, I got my teeth. Other old man says, boy, he says, that's marvelous. He says, that's really wonderful. He says, well, I'll tell you. He says, when I was 14 years old, I was a very sick boy. But my family doctor said to me, son, if you want to grow up to live to a ripe old age, you got to get fucked four times every day. And since then, I've been getting laid four times every day. The other guy says, that's wonderful. He says, by the way, how old are you now? He says, 24. <laughs> about this big fairy walks into the bar he's gorgeous he's just the most gorgeous queen you've ever seen in your life and every day he goes in the same bar and every day he says hello harry and the bartender always says hi you cunt hi you <laughs> every night he goes hello harry he says hi you old cunt how are you so one night he walks in he says hi harry he says hi you old cunt this big bag says listen he says if you ever call me that again i'll smash your face in for you so the bartender looks at him he says what are you crazy son every night you come in every night i say hi you cunt how come all of a sudden you're so insulted he says today i saw one <laughs> God, you're a great star. Good luck to you. Thank you. Jane and Murray. Jane, you were in a tough spot. You were wonderful. Just wonderful. I have an announcement here, please. Jack O'Brien is a prick. <laughs> Next. Oh, am I going to get it on account of that? In your case, there have been very, very few women in the history of the Friars who have graced the dais. I think Sophie Tucker and Martha Ray, and I think you're number three. And we're very, very happy and proud to have you today. Uh, I'm very, very happy that you're here at this moment. Uh, of course, at this time, I'd like to present your husband with the uh, Friar gift. Same cheap crap everybody gets. <laughs> Gold-plated cufflinks. <laughs> the picture of Lenny Kent <laughs> on the link. <laughs> and so, presenting the guest of honor, this afternoon's luncheon, and honestly, it was really wonderful to have him. He's a swell guy. From the Friars, our guest of honor, Humphrey Bogart. Thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. Members of the Friars Club, Red Buttons, and the rest of the boys on the day is here. Uh, uh, I, uh, I, you've all used up all the four-letter words that I knew, so uh, I'm not going to take up much time, and also my wife is here. And the more I look at her, as a matter of fact, now that uh, she's here, I think I have guts to marry her. You know? It takes a lot of guts. Uh, I've never been the guest of honor before of anything, but uh, if there is such a profession, I think I might take it up and sort of travel around the country being a guest of honor, 
wherever anybody would want me because I've never had so much fun in my life. I uh, highly flattered, and I'd like to thank you all, all of you, for being so nice to me. Thank you. For a moment, a few words from Mrs. Bogart. Well, I'm, uh, I'm really unprepared. I have uh, nothing to say to you, rat bastards. <laughs> Except that uh, finally, at long last, I have 400 men in a room and he's got to be here. Uh, thank you very much, though, for letting me come. I do appreciate it. And any time Humphrey is ready to come home, we'll go. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, gentlemen, and good afternoon. Thank you.